this is the face of fire. Not the friendly fire which man tames to work for him, but fire which has broken loose. This is wildfire, and in Canada it erupts 80,000 times a year. Each year it causes $100 million damage. Each year it kills 600 Canadians. Its victims are burned alive by flame itself. They are trapped and strangled by walls of smoke. They are quietly asphyxiated by the deadly fumes of carbon monoxide gas. They are crushed under tumbling debris. The National Research Council's fire section works with firefighters in investigating these tragedies. At dawn, they climb through the rubble and study the charred fragments, trying to piece together the first few moments when fire broke out. But fire investigation need not begin with smoldering ashes. At Research Council headquarters in Ottawa, experts are charged with the vital task of curbing the tragic loss of life and property. A new building houses the laboratories of the fire section. The fire section works with models furnished with miniature chairs, tables, drapes and even magazines. Wires to measure the spread of flame are connected to recording machines. Tiny rooms constructed of various materials are burned to test fire spread. By close observation of these model fires, Trained eyes trace the developments leading to the flashover point. From these experiments, experts can predict fire spread in different structures and devise means of reducing fire risk. But the model tests have inherent drawbacks. They can never quite simulate the development of a real fire. NRC scientists looked for actual buildings, life-size models for their experiments. They found what they wanted in Altsville, Ontario. Stout homes and public buildings, some of them a century old. The deserted buildings standing in the path of the St. Lawrence Seaway are marked for demolition. Altsville is a ghost town. Soon, the land is to be flooded by the Ontario Hydro Commission. Hydro turns the houses over to the fire section. The last visitors to the ghost town prepare a carefully controlled study of uncontrolled fire. The remaining bits of furniture are removed, and into the house goes fresh lumber. The amount and location of the lumber must match exactly the combustible furnishings that would sit in an actual home. The simulated furniture is left to dry out. In 
Ottawa instruments are prepared. Instruments to measure heat radiation. Instruments to sample the changes in the elements of the air, elements on which life or death depend, oxygen and carbon monoxide. An instrument to gauge smoke density inside a building. A microphone to pick up the sounds of fire. The smoke is measured as it crosses the beam between a light bulb and a photocell. These instruments probing the terrible interior of a burning building will serve as the eyes and ears of science. The life-sized experiments initiated in Ottawa attract international interest. English fire experts arrive to take part in the work, while American scientists come to observe the operation. Chemists, physicists and engineers move to their field laboratory. Wires leading to the house are plugged into a mobile recording unit. Copper tubes carry the deadly carbon monoxide fumes to the trailer for measurement. Inside the house, filters are hooked up. A sampling of the air in the burning building will feed the carbon monoxide through the crystals and into the tube leading to the trailer. Wires and instruments are threaded through each window. The smoke meter, microphone, every instrument is given a careful final check. They will provide the information that will determine the speed and specific cause of death by fire. One, two, three, four, five, testing. In the trailer, the instrument readings will be taken. As the fire spreads, the increasing proportion of carbon monoxide in the air will be measured. Another scientist will gauge the decreasing proportion of oxygen. Automatic recorders will trace smoke and radiation development. The temperatures in various parts of the building will be measured by wire thermometers. Thermal radiometers are set away from the building to measure heat generated by the fire. One type of radiometer automatically transmits readings to the trailer. A second radiometer is lined up on windows for more detailed readings. Inside the building, the instruments are ready. Instruments to observe the horrors of fire that no living man has ever seen. Now a final briefing for the scientists and men from the Ontario Fire Marshal's office. Cameras are ready to record the fire for future study. Tests continue to the final moments before ignition. Moisture content of the simulated furniture is checked to make certain it has dried sufficiently. Then the final simulation, a torch representing carelessness or neglect. Okay. Fire's off. A brick house with incombustible interior walls is a comparatively safe structure. But almost from the ignition point, the instruments inside begin to register a pattern of destruction. In two minutes, smoke has cut visibility in an open bedroom to zero. Three minutes more and the closed bedroom will be clouded with smoke. Even where only wisps of smoke curl through the house, invisible but deadly carbon monoxide fumes are present. The lethal gas is sampled every 30 seconds. Even now, the sounds of fire are not enough to wake a sleeping man. The routes to safety have disappeared behind billowing smoke. 
an occupant would be blinded and trapped. After only nine minutes, a person in this room would be unconscious, with carbon monoxide building to a lethal level. But conscious or unconscious, it wouldn't matter. By now, the heat on the second floor would burn out a man's lungs. A spark, 17 minutes earlier, has mushroomed into an inferno. Now the basement, last of the house to go, is filled with smoke and flame. radiation builds up. A single spark from the blaze and a frame house 26 feet away would burst into fire. As the blaze reaches its spectacular peak, the fire experts turn away. Their job is completed. By now the damage would be done. The flames would be spreading to other buildings the lives would be lost. The scientists move on down the empty main street to record the destruction of other buildings and to add to their catalog of information. Hundreds of accidental fires will break out across Canada this cold winter morning. But here in a ghost town, a fire is being deliberately set in an attempt to prevent disaster. It is set in a frame house with a combustible inner wall, a tinderbox. In two minutes, heat on the upper floor passes the lethal limit of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Visibility is gone. The ground floor is solid flame. In six and a half minutes, all life is destroyed. At this point, a frame building 40 feet away would explode into flame. In 30 minutes, it is over. The floors of this old hall have been torn out. Canadian scientists now work with British experts and prepare a special study of fire in a large single space. Anemometers to measure airspeed are set in the windows to record the rising ventilation rate in the huge room. Radiometers are raised to measure the tremendous heat given off by the blaze. All right, fire's off. Inside, the flames spread rapidly. Already, flames have whipped up a wind inside the building. Temperatures inside and radiation outside are recorded in the mobile laboratory. Despite all the instrumentation, experts still rely on personal observation. After only five minutes, the airspeed through the open window has climbed from zero to five miles per hour. After 16 minutes, the flashover, the building is now completely filled with flame. The 
heat outside would cause a frame house 32 feet away to ignite. Building after building falls as science continues to fight fire with fire. With the smoldering rubble, the test fires leave a mass of solid scientific data for use in fighting the fires of the future and in understanding the fires of the past. The study does not end with the last spectacular blaze. It really only begins when the findings are laid on desks in Ottawa. Months of close scrutiny follow, months of assessment and interpretation of the data. They talk in terms of calories per square centimeter per second, of selective catalytic oxidation, of induced ventilation. There are yards of charts, mountains of figures, dozens of graphs. They are learning to save lives. Tape recordings again take the expert inside the blazing buildings. Detailed films of each fire are run and rerun. Watching with the scientists are professional firemen. The films offer an opportunity for detached study aimed at improving firefighting tactics. Most important, from such experiments come concrete proposals aimed at preventing fire. In the National Research Council's Division of Building Research, masses of pertinent information are sifted and selected to become part of the National Building Code. The sections dealing with fire safety are of paramount importance to a country of low temperatures and high fire risk. As a part of the Division of Building Research, the fire section provides material that will lead to improvements in these fire safety provisions. This fire code is constantly being amended to keep abreast of modern developments. It goes out to hundreds of communities as a model on which to build a safer nation. To maintain this safeguard, men of the fire section, National Research Council, must always keep one step ahead with continuing investigation and research. <laughs>